Hey everyone, welcome to The Fan Lab, a limited series podcast that dives deep into the heartbeat of contemporary culture and commerce. I'm your host, Jonathan Hansen, the Chief Creative Officer of Unconquered, a creative agency unlocking the emotional power of fandom for brands. We created this podcast as an extension to a report we recently published called Decoding Fandom that's available on our website at weareunconquered.co or linked in the show notes. From the world of music and entertainment to the realm of business valuations and technology, fandom has become one of the most powerful forces in brand building over the past few years. We've seen it transform brands through our work in sports, athletic apparel and footwear, and we can see it across culture, showing up in the people lining up for monster energy tattoos to influencer-led brands like Prime Energy. Being a fan can be a profound connection that sparks a need to belong to something larger than ourselves while also giving us a chance to embrace our own unique individuality. In this series, we talk with experts in contemporary culture and fandoms, exploring it from every angle. We hope to shed light on how brands can work within fandom as a marketing tool through insightful discussions on how brands can create lifelong connections with their audience. For our first episode, we are talking with Avi Santo, a professor and department chair in communications at UNC Chapel Hill. We dive into the fascinating world of fandom, identity, and fan entrepreneurship. Through his research and expertise in media studies, Santo sheds light on the intersection of consumer culture, fan communities, and merchandise. Thank you for listening, and here's my conversation with Avi. Um, are you in the Virginia area? Where are you these days? I, we live in Durham. Uh, so we were, I was at Old Dominion uh, for 16 years. Uh, we lived in Norfolk. And, okay. uh, and we in July, we moved here to Durham, and now I'm at UNC Chapel. What What brought you? What was the, what was the change? I mean, I think, I mean, some, some of it is the usual money, yeah. uh, you know, those types <laughs> of things. Uh, you know, I mean, UNC Chapel Hill is obviously the oldest university in the country. It's storied, it's beautiful, yeah. you know, so I think just the opportunity, I think, to work at a kind of flagship university in a kind of, that has a sense of its responsibility to the state and to the, and to, you know, training future students is really meaningful to me. You know, that said, yeah. I loved ODU. I was, you know, I, I, I don't think there were, you know, there were, there were many reasons to stay. It was not an easy decision. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, and I'm curious to like how, how you got into this area of, of study. Um, were you always interested in media and were, were you a, you know, a self-described geek um, yourself growing up? Did you have like these hardcore fandoms that you were a part of? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, I mean, I would I would certainly describe myself as uh, you know as a geek growing up uh, at a time when being a geek wasn't necessarily a term that had certain ca- had cachet attached to it because this was yeah. the, you know nineteen eighties. Uh, mm-hmm. But um, you know, I think so. For me, my background, uh, my PhD is in radio, television, film, so I'm a media studies scholar uh, by training, and my focus right out the gate was actually not so much on fandom, but on licensing and merchandising. I was really interested Mm -hmm. in the way in which media IP was extended into people's lives through material culture, through things that they bought and why, and ultimately how those things were sold as part of an experience related to a brand. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, and increasingly as time went on, what people did with them, which got me into this kind of fandom space. Uh, My, you know, my first book selling the silver bullet uh, is looking mm-hmm. at the sort of history of character licensing uh, in the entertainment industry starting in the 1930s through, you know, through the current moment. But, uh, but the goal is to trace this historical trajectory of what we now think of as convergence culture and transmedia, uh, exp- a sort of, a, you know, uh, extension as actually having a very long history. And that if you look back at characters like the Lone Ranger, you mm-hmm. can see a lot of the practices that we now see as commonplace being experimented with all the way back in the 1930s. And so, so you know, it starts from that space of an actual strong interest in consumer culture and consumer products in brand extensions, uh, particularly media brand extensions through consumer products. And then increasingly, you know, as I start thinking about what people do with these things, you see some disconnect, right? That the mm-hmm. intention and what people do are quite different. Actually, it's always what people do with these brands are always more interesting than what the intentions are. Agreed. Uh, you know, and so, you know, uh, and then trying to figure out, you know, sort of where are the spaces in which um, increasingly still with an interest in in, in material culture and stuff, essentially, uh, where are the spaces where we see fan communities coming in, what we now call fan entrepreneurs, right? People yep. sort of coming in and creating their own content their own their own objects uh using ip often without you know uh 
without regard for copyright, uh, certainly, you know, sort of walking a line in terms of whether it would cost, whether it would qualify as fair use or not, mm -hmm. but ultimately um, filling in gaps, right? You know, uh, you know, sort of presenting, providing communities with things that they desire as part of their connection to this fandom material objects that aren't licensed for various reasons, sometimes because there's no money in it, uh, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a niche, mm -hmm. too much of a niche community, sometimes because those objects kind of, uh, challenge the kind of core brand identity that the brand owners have right uh, they may sort of uh, involve you know sexual content or mm -hmm. you know sort of present images that kind of you know or they were actually the or the opposite they could present images that are actually quite uh progressive in their in their sort of uh, uh depiction but you know brands tend to be conservative they don't want to rock the boat they're they usually trying to be apolitical and so you know i mean so there's there are you know really tapping into these markets that don't currently exist uh, you know, and trying to understand what's at stake there, trying to understand mm -hmm. also the way in which basically when someone creates an Etsy store, you know, and they sort of market themselves as sort of selling branded materials to fan communities, to what extent their own fan identity is part of what's being sold, right? Why would you choose mm -hmm. to, if you could go on Etsy and you could find a thousand different stores that could create some sort of tchotchke featuring a favorite you know, video game character of yours that you couldn't otherwise find on the in the store shelves, why would you choose one creator over another? I mean, some of it might be about price points, some of it might be about you know aesthetic, uh, mm -hmm, you know, sort mm -hmm. of taste. Some of it might be about what you perceive to be quality, although that can be hard to tell mm -hmm. online. A lot of it's going to have to do with whether you feel like this person truly has the same kind of love for the brand that you do. Uh, you know, you're going to mm -hmm. really kind of try to identify someone who sees who see, who identifies as a fan, and so increasingly, part of what's going on in fan entrepreneurship is the marketing of self as fan. As much as it is, as much as the products that then extend from that fan practice. Yeah, absolutely. What I, what I think is like so interesting about it is this the psychological side to fans and and as you pointed out, identity. And, and I'm I'm curious to how or if in your work you've studied or, or looked into the, that that part of identity and how it's like um, a piece that is reflected back or if it, is it aspirational. Um, you know, what are the, you know, where are these pieces coming from? So sometimes when I think of like brand fandom, I think of people wearing the logos just for this, the, 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 maybe the association, like, oh, I'm smarter. I make more money. I do these sorts of things. Um, and I'm curious if that translates as well into, into like the more entertainment or other sorts of, of fandoms that aren't necessarily particularly based in like the purchasing in, in, of, of consumerism around, you know, buying a Mercedes versus buying like my favorite um, baseball team's hat. Right. So I think that, I mean, these are great questions and I'll lead with what I don't do. I'm not a social psychologist, so I uh -huh. would not pretend that I sort of can draw from that particular sort of, uh, sort of um, particular literature. I do think, however, that identity is really a, a key factor, but in, in ways that I think are both sort of more complicated than the binary that you're creating uh, yeah. that, you're, that you're presenting. And also, I think, uh, you know, in some, in some ways, uh, it's really very much rooted in what is what can be expected from the experience. So I think one, let's start with the idea that, you know, I don't, I actually think what you're describing when you talk about someone buying, you know, uh, Mercedes or buying, you know, uh, a branded uh, fashion piece of fashion clothing with a particular design, high end designer. That's what we talk about is lifestyle branding, right? This is the mm -hmm. sort of ability to present oneself as sort of aligned with a particular lifestyle, usually associated with luxury, right? A certain mm -hmm. kind of sensibility to it. Um, on the one hand, media fandoms work a little bit differently. On the other hand, they don't, right? On the one hand, um, I'll start with how they don't, and then I'll, then I'll go to how they do. Um, mm -hmm. How they don't, I mean, I think increasingly we see lots of intersections and convergence between high-end luxury brands and media brands, right? You know, the ability to have the, like, $3,000 a night Star Wars experience at Disney, uh, you know, stay at their five-star luxury hotel, uh, you know, is a good example of the way in which mm -hmm. luxury and, you know, and 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 sort of media fandom can combine, or we see lots of, inter lots of interesting intersections between high-end, you know, uh, cosmetics or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, or, or, or fashion brands and particular media properties. So, so there is a convergence there that is interesting, right, for the person who wants to both, uh, you know, sort of convey that they have a certain class status, but also an affiliation with a certain community. I think where they differ, uh, and this is also not unrelated from what I just said, uh, I think that to some extent, when you engage in a certain kind of lifestyle sort of acquisition strategy when it comes to media and popular culture fandoms, 
you are essentially walking a sort of ironic line, right? I think that when mm -hmm. we see a lot of these types of products that are, you know, so if you think about the person who's going to spend $3,000 a night to stay at this, you know, luxury, you know, high end luxury Star Wars, uh, you know, uh, resort experience at Disney. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, to do that, you have to have the means to do it. But if you have the means to do it, why would you choose Star Wars as opposed to something that has a more obvious conveyance of luxury? In some ways, I mean, part of it may have to do with a love for Star Wars, which is genuine. But a lot of mm -hmm. it, I think, also has to do with the desire to sort of communicate a certain kind of ironic relationship to luxury, right? A desire mm -hmm. to say, like, I'm in, I am I want this experience, but I also want to convey that I'm not the type of person who cares that much about this experience, even as I'm willing to pay all this money for this experience, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's an interesting kind of tension there between that sort of luxury, sort of a desire for luxury, but also a kind of desire to sort of step away. I mean, a fandom has always existed, you know, here's the thing, fandom has always existed on the on the margins. Luxury is something that also exists on the margins because most people can't afford it, but is seen as something that is aspirational. aspirational. Sort of reach to. And so this allows for a kind of both and uh, element, I think, to kind of to kind of come together. You can both have the luxury, but also express a certain kind of um, ambivalence towards it or or, you know, or, or sort of a, a ironic take on it. The other thing that you see happening, obviously, and this is the the sort of interesting thing i think for me about lifestyle when it comes to fandom is that lifestyle branding and fandom intersect at the luxury end but they also intersect at the mundane end right that mm -hmm. really and so you know if, if for the most part within marketing and brand culture lifestyle is often equated with high-end luxury within sort of media and popular culture fandom it, it does have that element but it's also equated with you know branded toothbrushes and you know branded uh, mm -hmm. low end, you know, uh, bed sheets and things like mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. but that suggests that the, it's a sort of walking a line between ubiquity and luxury, right? And that really when fans engage in a kind of lifestyle practice through their acquisition, they are often doing both ends, right? They will mm -hmm. often have a lot of ubiquitous, mundane, everyday objects, you know, that basically insert their fandom into everything from, you know, hygiene to, you know, just basic sort of, uh, you know, necessity around the house. Um, and then they will also invest at, at strategically in certain high-end kind of uh, opportunities, you know, uh, as they can afford them. They might have to save up a long time for that Star Wars luxury trip, or if they want to get the intersection of like the high-end, uh, you know, what, what were they, or like that, that high-end like convection oven that is branded yeah. with like Han Solo or something like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, they might save up for something like that, but that's probably, but they're going to start with the low-end mundane pieces and then move towards it. Well, it reminds me of like uh, me being a my I being a kid and having my He Man pajamas and um, you know my Star Wars bed sheets as you pointed out and like all these little uh, things that kind of kids are it's naturally a part of their lifestyle I think just from from a childhood experience perspective. Um, but I'm curious what how age plays into this because it seems like some things are just generally marketed to children. Um, when you think about like you know toothbrushes or um, you know, either He-Man pajamas or, or whatever. Um, and I'm curious in your work, have you seen it, this segmented out and and it, how age and and um, maybe even gender play into the the marketing or creation of fan merchandise? Sure. I mean, in, in lots of ways, right? You know, and, and this, there's not one simple answer here. So I will start, start with the idea of saying, you know, there's a lot of intersection between merchandise that is sold to children based on media products and then life and then merchandise that is sold to fan communities uh mm -hmm. based on media products and that increasingly i mean for a long time i think those were imagined as very discreet audiences right kids wanted toys and they wanted you know and 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 and, and you could convince parents to buy branded objects that could be seen as helpful in helping students in getting kids to acclimate to like you know proper socialization right it's important to brush your teeth it's important to get ready for bed having this thing that you love maybe get makes that easier for parents and then you had these objects for adults uh which were often more luxury oriented or, or had less utilitarian value increasingly i think what we see is an effort to cultivate a certain kind of fandom starting with childhood that's going to progress into adulthood and so you see levels and layers right you'll see Yes, you know, toothbrushes are still mainly addressed to kids, but you can find high-end $100 electric toothbrushes that you're probably not getting your six-year-old, uh, you know, that are probably aimed more at teenagers or young adults. You can mm -hmm. get the, the Star Wars pajamas or the He-Man pajamas 
in all age categories. I encourage you to go to a uh, you know, hot topic or, or any other type yeah. of store and you'll find that stuff, right? So mm-hmm. there's a sense that you can age up into these into these pieces um, that's that's there as well. And I do think that like, you know, in part the quite, you know, this becomes when you think about why someone would want to do that. I mean, some of it is a love of character, a love of a particular brand, a love of a particular media property. Although the reality is that brand owners don't want that kind of fan, right? The brand owners want someone who, I mean, they want someone who's loyal to a brand, but they also recognize that there's a certain kind of agnostic agnostic quality to it, right? They want someone who's just going to continue to buy brands, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you know, and so there's there's a, a in many ways a lot of it's about what a kind of fan lifestyle affords adults as they step into it, right? So mm. you think about you know the challenges of our society, right? Most of what you know, there's a lot. I mean, our society has a tremendous amount of challenges, and so I'm going to be mm-hmm. very reductive here in terms of identifying of one that's at the core. But one of the core challenges that our society in particular faces is this tension between essentially individualism and the collective, right? Fitting in and standing out. Uh, you know, we struggle with this. I mean, so, you know, America, you know, individualism is a very strong identity within America, within the United States. And there's a kind of sense that brands can help one both, you know, establish some sort of individuality through the choices mm-hmm. they wear or the choices that the things they own. Uh, of course, there's irony there is that most of these things are mass produced. So therefore, you know, uh, you and 100,000 other people have that baseball cap, uh, you know, mm-hmm. so its ability for you to stand out in the crowd is also mitigated by the fact that there's also a community of people that share mm-hmm. that. But it's part that's the desire. That's the key, right? It, this by 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 choosing a particular, you know, brand, you know, brand object to wear, you can do both in theory, you can both stand out and fit in at the same time, right? You have mm-hmm. a community of people that care about this, but you're also able to establish a certain aspect of who you are. It also allows for, and if you think of a fandom as kind of always existing, you know, uh, not well, always is probably overstating it. Fandom is, has existed at the kind of, as I said, at the margins of our society for a, for a long time, fandom wasn't cool, right? It's mm-hmm. really only starting in the early 2000s with the kind of popularization of geek culture that fandom suddenly becomes something that uh, media industries, brand owners want to affiliate with. Really, if you look at the literature on fandom in the 1980s and 1990s and earlier, fans are losers, right? Mm-hmm. Fans are overly obsessed, overly invested. They're not they're not the person you want representing your brand, right? The person you want representing your brand is, you know, an average Joe who's, you know, basically want, you know, who who who, mm-hmm. who, who, who can use this in a meaningful way and has not sort of is not deeply focused on it on what this brand can do. Once we see the shift where suddenly fandom becomes something that has value, economic mm-hmm. value, social value, cultural value, then we have this opportunity where suddenly fandom that's existing on the margins as something that's undesirable actually becomes reconceptualized as something that still exists at the margins, but actually uh, is something that, you know, sort of can allow one to participate actively in society. And so what that means, at least for me, is that what happens when adults invest in a kind of fan lifestyle, it's a fan lifestyle that's, I should say again, agnostic of products, right? You can move from Star Wars to He-Man to She-Ra to Star Trek to, you know, you can keep keep on going to the next Marvel, you know, uh, MCU movie. But, but these objects, when you choose to go out of the house wearing, you know, a t-shirt with any of those objects, right? You know, right now what that conveys in some ways is your ability to both conform and rebel at the same time, right? Mm-hmm. That you exist at the margins, right? It's about saying like, I'm going to the office, but I'm wearing this, you know, He-Man t-shirt. So, you know, I'm not the type of person who wears a suit and tie, right? Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you're also investing in a mainstream, uh, you know, brand, you know, owned by uh, one of the largest toy companies and now entertainment companies in the world and Hasbro, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, that is recognized and beloved by millions of people around the world. So your rebelliousness is somewhat constrained and contained, but you can still sort of take on that air of a certain kind of rebelliousness through your investment in this kind of fan lifestyle um, without needing to actually be on the margins, right? Without actually Mm -hmm. needing to be uh, necessarily sort of outside of what society will allow. Historically, that, you know, that's a, that's a shift within the conceptualization of fandom uh, that allows it to be then connected with lifestyle from the perspective of brand owners and perspective of consumers in a more meaningful way. Mm-hmm. 
And I, I'm curious, that as you talk about it being sort of like a way to establish yourself maybe as different or an outlier, but even though it's still tied to like, you know, a, a quarter mainstream property, I, I'm, I'm wondering if that's where some of the um, individual fan creation comes in, the co-creation, like making their own fan products, adding a level of scarcity or uniqueness that isn't going to be available to like, you know, be able to go into Target and buy something. Um, do you think that plays in a little bit with this idea of helping keep it fringe or help keeping it quote like authentic um, and kind of rebelling against that, that like, as you said, the irony of, of the consumerist aspect of it? To some extent, yes. I mean, I think that as fandom becomes more mainstreamed, as brand owners actively talk about wanting to cultivate fans mm -hmm. and, and essentially, you know, brand owners often conflate consumers and fans in very there are differences, but I think they conflate them off all the time, right? Someone buys something as a fan of something, which is not exactly, I think, what 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 what's happening. Mm -hmm. But I think as this as there is this mainstreaming of fandom, we see communities of people who perhaps have a who claim to be the OG fan, right? Who claim to have mm -hmm. a deeper investment in that fandom, uh, you know, doubling down on how they can sort of differentiate themselves from this essentially kind of mainstream this sort of you know fake fan uh you know and, and you know but it's not in ways that reject acquisition it's not in ways that reject consumer products or consumerism right it's often in just in search of particular sort of uh outlets to acquire these things right and that's where i think places like etsy or redbubble uh you know or other types of craft uh you know spaces mm -hmm. for fans and fan entrepreneurs come into play where they can offer essentially an experience that is still related to acquisition, still connected to this idea of owning an object related to that fandom, uh, but can position it as outside the mainstream as, you know, something that because it doesn't have a, an official license, isn't fully sanctioned by mm -hmm. the company, even though I would say 90% of the stuff that's created would probably have no problem, uh, at least in terms of content being accepted it might have issues in terms of quality and things of that nature mm -hmm. um but i do think that so i think there is that kind of community of people that really want to sort of be able to say how can i differentiate myself even within this sort of expanding field and this is where i think you also get to some of these kind of one of a kind of opportunities that exist within these spaces right so if you go to etsy or redbubble most of the things you're going to buy are just in a catalog of stuff Right, you know, cell phone cases. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's you right. Know, you know, and, and, and oftentimes that's right. You go to a store and they have you know a hundred different kinds and from from fifteen different fandoms, right? So mm -hmm. in some ways, right, you know, it can be hard to say like, well, why 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 is this particular store better than another? But I do think you know there's this other layer that I think Etsy and Redbubble can offer. Not not every store does, but most do, um, which is different than the mainstream consumer experience, and that is the ability to customize. That is the ability to ask, a, you know, a store owner to make something that is particular, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that may not be existing in the marketplace or, you know, but either either as an object or in a particular visualization of it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and that then can serve multiple purposes, right? It, it might be something you have a personal connection to, but it also allows you, I think, to establish a certain kind of credential within fandom, within a particular fandom that is not, that is, that is you know that 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 rises above if you will the the thing that you can find on the target or walmart yeah shelf. it kind of allows that space for the personal story to to come through um and really be actually seen maybe even even in the thing you're acquiring you know you love this particular aspect of the character or this certain thing that they do maybe can you bring this out and in, in what you're making i can i can totally see how that reinforces the value of it right absolutely right so i think you know if you if you i think you probably read my piece on fan and fans and merchandise so i, I talk did about yeah that in talk about an example in there of my own you know from my, my own family situation where you know uh when my kids were very young they were really obsessed with the the movie the whiz uh mm -hmm. you know and the soundtrack from it but you know obviously that movie came out in the early 1980s and um and even then wasn't highly merchandised so you know there was not a lot available and so we mm -hmm. ended up turning really we turned to Etsy to have these commissioned peg dolls, these commissioned, uh, you know, um, puppets, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which, of course, you know, uh, allowed us to kind of, you know, engage, 
we use we use their fan, you know, we use their love for it. And we use sort of fan practice to basically bond with, with our children. Now, mm-hmm. that's a very personalized experience, right? But what then happens beyond that, that sort of moves it into this realm of fandom is when I take photos of these objects and I put them online as a way of sort of demonstrating my commitment to mm-hmm. this fandom, right? I'm willing to pay additional money. I'm willing to have these objects. I have these objects that no one else is going to have. They essentially kind of convey a certain status, um, mm-hmm. you know, and then also, I think one of the things I recount in that story is that, you know, when we were sort of figuring this out, it was really important for us to identify store owners on Etsy who also loved the Wiz, right? Lots mm-hmm. of people said they could do it, but mm-hmm. we had people going like, you know, I mean, I, I, so when I initially commissioned, I sent emails, I sent like messages to probably about a dozen store owners saying, hey, you know, we'd like to have these peg dolls mm-hmm. uh, commission, you know, uh, I see that you make these things. Could you do it for, for us? You know, some of them wrote back saying like, oh, I've never seen this movie before. We didn't go with them. Uh, you know, uh, we went with the person who basically said, oh, yeah, I love this movie. Right. You know, mm-hmm. I, you know, because, you know, that in some ways was a, a reassurance for us that we were going to get something that is high quality and has the kind of, you know, that that soft fuel that, you know, that love factor involved in it that, Absolutely. you know, that is meaningful. And essentially, when I talk about entrepreneurs and fan-made merchandise, I'm often talking about that aspect of it that's key, right? It's not just the object itself. It's the foregrounding of the fact that it's made by fans for fans, uh, you know, that is that is essential, right? It kind of conveys. So in that sense, it's not just that the object itself could be distinct from what you can get on the target shelf, but it's mm-hmm. also about the ability to support community, support, you know, business, you know, in the same way that we might someday say we want to support our local, support local businesses, or, you know, we should, mm-hmm. depending on, you know, supports, you know, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, SWAM businesses, small women and minority owned businesses. There's also a kind of perception that like within fan culture, you support fan businesses, right? You support mm-hmm. businesses mm-hmm. where that piece is there. And that's partly how you demonstrate a certain kind of authenticity, uh, you know, mm-hmm. that is sort of essential to your own fan credentials. Mm-hmm. And I mean, on the on that idea of authenticity, do you think there's like uh, something that you see commonly like as a mistake that brands or brand partnerships make when they're trying to connect with these audiences? Because you know, you see it because when it blows up, it blows up uh, magnificently. It's it's huge. Um, uh, and I'm curious if if you know in in your research and your work that you've been doing, if you see commonalities in that in those mistakes. There's some common themes that I see emerging, you know, uh, recently um, I just had this essay come out um, that I can send you a copy of if you want, which is uh, focused on sort of hot topic. And it's thinking about sort of hot topic as this space that markets itself as, you know, essentially for fans, um, but Mm -hmm. a certain kind of approach to fandom that is really at stake here. So I think the tensions that I see are, you know, I'm going to talk broadly and, you know, and, and, and then, you know, we can think about what specific examples, maybe where they play out that way. But, you know, one, I think that some of the common mistakes is that oftentimes brands, when they engage, you know, fan, either consumers as fans or fan communities, um, they focus on sort of individuals rather than thinking about the importance of that fandom as a communal experience, right? Mm -hmm. And this is partly because as a consumer, because from a consumerist mentality, you're always selling things to individuals, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, um, but fandom ultimately has always been a communal experience, right? And so mm-hmm. thinking about how, you know, even if you're engaging an individual, uh, you know, as a consumer, how that engagement is going to connect into a broader communal experience is often key. And sometimes that gets left out. In fact, if anything, I often see situations where uh, brand owners sort of pit fans against each other, right? Oh, mm. competitions to, you know, let's, you can each submit, everybody submits a piece of artwork and somebody will win a, you know, a prize. This kind of it's a divide and conquer strategy, right? But it ultimately, mm-hmm. I think, you know, undermines the sense of what people who are who are invested in that fandom are after, which is truly a communal experience. There are lots, of course, of entrepreneurs and people who would enter a competition because what they want is to get recognized and see it as a pathway towards co-creation, towards a potential job uh, in that mm-hmm. industry. I'm not sure those people actually are fans. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I'll give you an example of that in a minute if you're interested. But I think yeah, that, I would love I'd love to hear an example. But I think that in general. Right now, um, oftentimes there's a kind of mentality of competition that brand owners write onto fandom that I think misses the mark. So I'll give you two examples of this that really kind of strike me. One is from Hot Topic, right? Hot Topic had this 
uh, set of T-shirts that they marketed for a number of years. Uh, you know that literally, literally, you know that literally said, "My fandom is greater than your fandom." Mm-hmm. That's the T-shirt. That's all it says. My fandom is greater than your fandom. I mean, I'm like, I mean, it, you know, it's it's cute, and I'm sure people bought it, but ultimately, mm-hmm. the message that it conveys is this notion that you know, fandom ultimately boils down to competitiveness as opposed to collaborative spaces, and I think in that way it misunderstands. On the flip side, right? I think about let's say you know, circa 2000 and six, I want to say. I mean, I could be off of my year. Um, you know, we see the MTV Movie Awards create this category for. Uh, best fan spoofs, right? So they had this new category and it's designed to engage, uh, you know, fandom, right? And they encourage, you know, people to submit these kind of spoof trailers based on the movies that are nominated for the MTV Awards that year. And the winner Mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, a film called United 300, which combines the kind of, you know, in, you know, some off color way, United 93, which is the story of the 9-11 flight that, uh, you know, where the passengers took over the yeah. The airplane and uh the movie 300 you know about the roman not the Roman. what are they the uh, i forget you know the oh, um, i'm spacing on it as well i'm not sure but it's it's a you know, it's a it's a i'll send you the information anyway okay the you know the the trailer's fine it's a nice three minute trailer uh you know it wins this award the filmmaker is a man uh, by the name of andy signor uh, you know, mm-hmm. who, um, uh, you know, uh, wins this award and he then becomes one of the founders of a company called Fandom, uh, which basically produces the, uh, you know, uh, honest trailers videos on, on YouTube. If you've seen those, it's mm-hmm. a huge company worth, you know, deeply connected to, um, the media industries, right. It's got, you know, it, it, you know, long story short. So back around 2010, I have a chance to interview Andy about, you know, his experience here. And one of the things that he's really explicit with me about in this interview is that, you know, like I, I keep saying, so it must be incredible to think about how you move from being a fan to being a sort of, you know, be able to parlay that into this sort of mainstream participation, you know, in this kind mm-hmm. of burgeoning space as a you know, promotional space within the entertainment industries. And he repeatedly says to me, uh, you know, I'm not a fan. I was never a fan. I don't consider myself a fan. I'm a filmmaker. This was a pathway for me to, be able to mm. showcase my stuff to get attention from my work to basically get investors to support this idea, right? The fact that MTV, the MTV Movie Awards shows to call it a fan uh, spoof mm-hmm. video contest is irrelevant, right? So mm. in some ways, I think a lot of these competitive spaces they do attract contributions, but I'm not sure they actually contri- they attract these contributions from the fan communities themselves. The other thing that I think is really that where I think brand owners miss the mark around fandom is about the relationship that people have to objects, right? So sometimes fandom is really understood as a relationship between people and things. And at, at the end of the day, it's a relationship between people and people that exist through things. And that's an important distinction, right? That ultimately Absolutely. fandom is, is really facilitates, you know, fandom around a particular brand or a particular media property facilitates relationship building through that relation, through that connection. Mm-hmm. And so there always has to be an understanding of how acquisition of this thing, of this object, of this mer- piece of this piece of merchandise, that's uh, this branded merchant, this branded piece of merchandise, uh, can facilitate those relationship opportunities. I think sometimes we stop the brands stop, you know, right up, stop at the sense of like, well, people buy things, and and they're in their buying of their things. That's what the fandom is. It's actually about what the fandom affords them to, what buying those things affords them to do as fans. And that's often about the ability to engage others. Now, you know, this is not all a sort of a loving, kind thing. I don't want to make it sound like relationship building is all, community building is always, you know, everybody loves each other. There's often tremendous competitiveness within these communities. And there's often mm-hmm. tremendous, you know, over status, over who has, you know, who, 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 who has a the real best fan. stuff. Right, you know, who's quote, a real who's fan, a real, right? Who knows yeah. the most? Who has the you know? Uh, all those things exist, but so so it's not you know. But but ultimately, the objects that are being purchased have to serve those conversations in mm-hmm. meaningful ways, and so I think that's where we often see a kind of missed opportunity. One of the things I, I talk about uh, in this piece, I'll send you, is that hot topic kind of engages in what I see as kind of an, an, an interesting emerging fan practice around acquisition, which is what I call curatorial mediation right Uh where they 
increasingly encourage, and this is, this, you know, it sounds like a fancy term, but it's a very simple idea, right? They encourage fans to essentially take photos of themselves wearing these objects that they've purchased from Hot Topic, uh, typically branded objects. You know, Hot Topic has a lot of these licensed relationships with mm -hmm. uh, the mainstream entertainment industry around particularly clothing, but also other products. And, you know, basically curate essentially a version of themselves in it that you can then upload and use and participate through this kind of hot topic uh, online community. And essentially what curatorial mediation does is it allows for, you know, I think fans to basically embrace a, and sort of move from sort of this passive notion of I buy things to a more active notion of I curate, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm able to both express something about who I am through my wearing of this object, but also I think reframe what this object means to a broader community through my sharing of it and my sharing of my experience of wearing it in that space. And it becomes a much more, I think, complex set of interactions mm -hmm. than just I bought this thing and I, you know, I wear it, you know, to impress my friends. If that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Totally. It, it, what I find interesting is the, the the relationship, I guess, between buying something, as you said, is very singular versus the idea of, of having fans and being part of a fandom is the community side of it. Um, and over the last, I don't know, five, 10 years, I think we've seen more and more experiences evolve from, from some of the, some of the, um, you know, media or entertainment properties, even from a branded aspect, if you go to, you know, Coachella's happening, you go to Coachella and there's all these branded experiences where you can go in and sort of interact with these things. Um, and I'm, I'm curious if, if you think this, that that's something that's going to continue to evolve and, and replace some of that idea of like, oh, just buy this and you're part of the fandom, but no, go and be a part of the Stranger Things pop-up experience. Um, if you're, if, if you're a fan and want to commute, you know, communicate with others. Um, so do you think that's going to be kind of the quote future as we grow forward or how do you think this is going to evolve and to help and create that sense of community? So I think these, these kind of immersive experiences like, you know, uh, like the stranger things pop up, uh, you know, is certainly, I, I think, a, a, you know, an important aspect of engagement mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, is kind of uh, emerging, but I would say it's not particularly new, right? I think this idea that entertainment and shopping intersect has been experimented with really going back to the nineties, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, you know, so it, it's, 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 it's certainly, I think, um, building off of a kind of earlier desire to create this kind of what they call retail tame, retail tainment, I think it's what it's called, mm -hmm. right? This idea mm -hmm. of the merging of entertainment and retail um, and I think we're going to see more of that, right? I think it's both a way to engage actual fans, but also a way to draw people into an experience, into mm -hmm. a lifestyle, right? Where you can see yourself really sort of participating more actively, always in very managed ways, right? Part of what we want to think of is that these experiences, uh, you know, they give participants a set of options, uh, which is better than having none at all, but oftentimes, you know, in a very managed way, right? So that the uh, you know, so that there's there are limits on what you can actually do with this within this experience. I think mm -hmm. that's, but I think it's not. I mean, it's, so I think it's part of the way in which brand owners and the retail industry and consumer product divisions and licensing divisions within the entertainment industries are trying to address the the, the importance of engagement among fan communities that desire for that communal experience, but manage it in a way that sets it. You know, first of all, sets it in retail spaces right i think the, mm -hmm. the my to my understanding the stranger things pop up was mostly in like mall settings and other types of you know uh yeah i think that, exactly it's like really trying to think one channel like some of those cultural things of the 80s malls and etc right. right um but yeah it was definitely more in public gathering spaces right you know i think that there, so i think we, we'll see increasingly a lot more of that i think we also will see and we'll see it at the high end version of it you know the intersection of like you know star wars or marvel with like fashion shows uh -huh. uh, you know and things like that all that is part of a kind of acquisition of what we might think of cap the sort of the sort of association of economic capital with sort of social uh -huh. and cultural capital um i think that the other area that we're going to see and it's still something that's being worked out uh you know i um you know I, I had done these series of interviews with um, so the heads of consumer product divisions in the entertainment industry over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I just, I just published a book on this called uh, configuring the field of character uh, licensing. Um, you know, I can send you a link to it if you like, 
But yeah, one right. of the sort of um, key arguments I make, I have this chapter on it where I'm th- where I'm thinking about how the contemporary sort of character licensing industry is wrestling with the emergence of sort of these digital spaces and born digital properties. You know, obviously it's not new, right? But I mean, mm-hmm. over the course of the decade and what you know consumers want from that experience, and 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 increasingly what you know consumers want are these customizable opportunities, right? One of the things that digital spaces and the internet and spaces like Etsy afford is the ability to, you know, customize something to look the way you want it, to, you know, Mm -hmm. kind of, uh, you know, as an on-demand sort of shopping experience that radically goes against the models that are in place for how products reach consumers, right? So Mm -hmm. when Nike develops a new shoe, right, uh, you know, sometimes they're, you know, the, sometimes they might invite fans to participate in making recommendations. Sometimes they just choose a celebrity who sort of stands in for mm-hmm. a fan community or they have a fan community already. But once they've made their decision about the shoe that they're going to produce, it, you know, they contract a manufacturer likely in China or some other uh, developing country where it's a low cost manufacturing opportunity. And then they connect either directly through their online retail store or their night or their own stores or to the relationships with retail partners that they have to get these things on shelves. It's rarely the opportunity, you know, uh, other than if it's like a made a sort of big sort of once in a, you know, uh, like a, a stunt opportunity where you can go to Nike's website and you can design your own Nike shoe and they will custom make that particular pair of shoes just for you. And if you can do that, have that be affordable, uh, mm-hmm. you know? And so, I think we're seeing here is that the future beyond these kind of immersive experiences is in trying to figure out how you can create these kind of customizable opportunities, um, you know, that kind of meet fans where they're at. I had a, I, I interviewed, um, I interviewed someone who was a head of a company that ultimately went, didn't succeed. It went, it went, it went, uh, it went bankrupt. It was called uh, Peacemaker. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it's an interesting play on the word peace, right? It's spelled peace, mm. like P-I-E-C, like you're making pieces. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, I think it was about mediation also between sort of the desires of brand owners and retailers and the desires of fans. And what this company proposed to do was set up 3D printers in retail stores that mm. could allow fans to get certain customized objects for particular brands uh, that could be sort of printed on demand, but still controlled. And so the example they often gave was like, you know, um, Barbie, right? It wouldn't, you know, the machine wouldn't 3D print an actual Barbie doll, you know, but what it could do is it could offer you a number of customized op selections of outfits that it mm-hmm. could print for you. Uh, you know, while you shopped, right? It would take, you know, take an hour or 90 minutes. You go around the store. They want you to have a great, you know, great buying experience. And then you can come back and get this item. And the idea was that, you know, it was that, that it facilitated a certain amount of customization, but it also provided limitations. They were very explicit about saying this way, Mattel could make consumers feel like they're getting what they want, but could also ensure that no one was going to print, you know, the Barbie dress where, where, where she's giving someone the finger, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, so. <laughs> You know, so it was about trying to manage and mitigate the sort of customization opportunities and didn't succeed. Uh, it didn't succeed in part because I think people don't want to wait 90 minutes in a store uh, mm-hmm. for, for this object. And I also think that they probably had some licensing challenges in terms of getting brand owners to sort of buy into this. I think there's brand owners often have con- concerns about the quality of merchandise and 3D printing is still kind of on the edge. Mm-hmm. I mean, on the one hand, we see it doing amazing things and like, you know, biomedics and other types of places. Mm-hmm. Yeah, on the other hand, I'm not sure, you know, that, uh, you know, like that, that Adidas would like ultimately support, you know, 3D printed shoes. Uh, you yeah. Know, because- there, there's a brand safety aspect to it. Right. Like, and, and what I think is interesting when you, when we look at the word IP, you know, intellectual property, it, it assumes ownership. It's, it was created to protect the, the, the ownership of it. And, um, at a certain point, I think, like, as we've talked about a bit, um, sometimes the fans and the people who are really love it um, c- often advance and create things that are better than the the original source in some ways. Um, but the IP can get in the way of of, of making that 
um, a more a more widespread thing. And it's it just and it seems like such a like a tricky dance between um, telling your fans not to do something because you risk alienating and put them boycotting and everything else, and then also embracing um, the thing so much that they they can add to it. So you know, when you think when I think about this, I wonder where do you draw the line between like fan co creation and and maintaining you know brand safety or um, making sure quality quality is there and, you know and i'm wondering if this is maybe the new a new opportunity for brands to think as they think about you know supply chain has been a big issue here and that's kind of what we were getting at with the with the idea with nike like it's really hard to like be able to just customize and make things for a million people um so as as brands yeah. think the impossible so as brands think through like their supply chain how they are able to produce things i think this could be an opportunity um to help really i think pull some of these ideas together and create more customized um, pieces that play off their uh, original IP. So I think there's a lot of a lot there to unpack, and I'm going to sort of try to tap into a couple of different threads that you've, mm-hmm. that you've mentioned. Um, so on the one hand, I think that it's sometimes a misnomer that brand owners somehow are always going to choose higher quality and safety over. Mm-hmm you know, fan communities, there's lots of examples where brand owners, you know, engage in unethical sweatshop labor practices, and will choose the cheapest mechanism possible to get something on storefronts, actually, and and there's also lots of examples where, you know, fan made merchandise is incredibly high quality, in part, because that's what the fan community demands. So sometimes I think Mm -hmm. it's it's an argument that's made as a sort of a straw argument, right, that Mm -hmm. isn't necessarily that's designed to sort of allow brand owners and IP owners to maintain their control, but it isn't always fully backed by actual evidence supporting this in all instances. And I think that's partly a, a recognition of that and, and an admission of that allows for a potential expansion of what is possible within this space. Secondarily, and this is, a, you know, again, um, important, I think it's important to recognize that like, that the actual understanding of what intellectual property law and particularly copyright law is supposed to do, trademark law works a little bit differently, and I'm happy to talk about that as well, right? is that intellectual property law is designed to help strike a balance between the rights of creators slash owners. It's complicated mm-hmm. because a lot of the people who own, a lot of the companies that own these brands aren't the actual creatives, mm-hmm. but, but it's supposed to strike a balance between the rights of creatives, creators slash owners, and the rights of the public. And that balance is embedded in things like term limits and, um, you know, and also fair use claims, right? So in other words, it's not licenses. simply that licenses are one mechanism that that mm-hmm. can that can that can do that as well, which is what I'm moving towards, right? Mm-hmm. But if we think of it as if we understand that intellectual property law is supposed to strike a balance, right? It's about it basically recognizes that at some point in time, the rights of society may be greater than the rights of the owners of this particular intellectual property, and that even if that intellectual property is still profitable. The rights of society eclipse it. We see these arguments happen all the time. For example, over when a character like Mickey Mouse is about to go into the public domain, right? Mm-hmm. Where the sort of terms of copyright have expired, and Disney is petitioning, of course, to get these terms extended even further. And they'll often argue things like, "Well, but you know, we're still making money off of Mickey Mouse, so he can't go in the public domain." That's not how. Actually, that's not actually how copyright law works, right? It doesn't matter if Mickey is still profitable. At some point in time, the argument is that as a piece of Americana, as a sort of emblem that has sort of become so, you know, ubiquitous in Americans' lives and people in kids' lives as they establish who they are, at some point in time, the rights of the public greatly exceed Disney's rights, right? Mm-hmm. And, sh- and there needs to be a place where that shift happens. Um, they also argue things like, well, if Mickey went into the public domain, you know, people would abuse it. They don't understand the value that the values that Mickey stands for. You'd have all this Mickey Mouse pornography. First of all, Mickey Mouse pornography is fair use. So you are, it already exists. Okay. Uh, you know, that's uh, hilarious. But, but, but secondly, it's a kind of, a, it's a, it's a diminishment of the idea that the, you know, that essentially the public, it, it basically what it wants to do is basically suggest that brand owners and corporations are the only ones capable of being effective stewards for mm-hmm. these brands, right? That that the reason to entrust Mickey Mouse to Disney is not just because Mickey because Disney is making money from Mickey Mouse, but because Disney is the only company capable of truly understanding Mickey's inherent value, is val- the values that Mickey stands for, the meanings that you know that that he convey that the character conveys to the public. 
I think if we, if companies were willing to move away from some of that rhetoric, that's, you know, uh, that would, you know, it would, it would, it would generate a slightly different mindset. And so ultimately, you know, that's, that's not a practical solution, but it's about recognizing that a lot of this is driven by a mindset that basically suggests that corporations must constantly look to protect their IP at all times in ways that often close down even the possibility of imagining co-creation opportunities or collaborative opportunities, or mm. even just the very idea that maybe there are meanings that are attached to a particular property that are not necessarily the ones the company thinks, uh, you know, are, you know, are, thinks they are. And so there, I think like if that mindset shifts and then that's accompanied by a kind of um, ability to think to work directly with entrepreneurs on, let's say, sites like Etsy or Redbubble through licensing agreements, right? You know, these could be, you know, uh, where I think fan, you know, where, where certain fan owners, as long as they met certain criteria, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and what those criteria are matter. I mean, ultimately, right, those criteria might be so restrictive that it undermines the very objective here. But ultimately, mm -hmm. if there was some sort of uh, criteria that largely focused on, um, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, some sort of compliance around uh, around quality and safety, which I do think are, are really paramount, maybe a little bit more flexibility around content, maybe still within certain parameters, but, but you know, um, then I think that that could happen. In fact, we do see examples of that, right? There are, in fact, you know, store owners on Etsy that do have licensing agreements with brand owners, uh, you know, and they become the only ones capable of producing a particular version of a particular character. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sites like Etsy and Redbubble are not very good at foregrounding that uh, in part mm -hmm. because their entire ethos is about this is like you know bottom up mm -hmm. you know crafting spaces uh so but at the end of the day i mean they're run like businesses right i mean at the end of the day a shop owner on etsy is you know uh despite the rhetoric that they're doing it for the love of it you know if you know uh is likely trying to actually make a living off of this or at the very least if not make a living off of it you know make more money than it costs them uh you know to you know to, to run to 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 buy materials and make this you know and, and and take time out of out of away from another job in order to make this these objects and then to factor in whatever Etsy is going to charge them in terms of you know uh, all you know for being for having a place on on having a store site on their on their on their web platform so mm -hmm. I, I do think you know if we accept on the one hand a lot of entrepreneurs are practicing you know a kind of uh, you know what we might think of as a small business owner meant approach, uh, you know, uh, and operating in what might be considered a, a gray economy, uh, mm -hmm. you know, where they are, you know, they're using pretty normative business practices, but the only difference is, is that they're usually selling content and materials that is not officially licensed. Uh, and then if you combine that with the fact that a lot of brand owners oftentimes overplay how much and how much of an investment they have in you know, in uh, quality protection uh, versus, I think the desire is there versus necessarily the actual, uh, you know, follow through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, then I think that there's a way in which these groups can come together. So this mm -hmm. is a very long way of saying, yes, I think <laughs> that there is an opportunity for co-creation and for licensing agreements that are amended for particularly for fan communities. But it probably starts with a broader set of recognitions that some of the kind of assumptions that we have about brand owners and and their sort of positions and fans and they and, and and what they're doing are not always gelling with what's actually happening mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we're, we're approaching time and and as we wrap things up i would love to hear from you um you mentioned earlier a little bit about your own personal experience with with you know, your kids fandom in some ways what, what are you really into right now what are you uh, are you watching anything that that has you participating at least in a, in a community or do you, is it more of a personal experience um within that with, within that thing you're engaging with yeah you know uh, so you know uh my kids got really into and I, my kids and myself uh, got really into the shira and the princesses of power uh -huh. uh, netflix series uh, from a couple of years ago uh, a couple of years back you know during the pandemic we you know so we we, mm -hmm. we watched it we watched it binge watched it multiple times um you know and so i'm very interested in the you know there's a good example of um you know a property so you know shira uh, you know uh, you know similar to he-man you know owned by hasbro uh 
I thought it was Mattel, but I think it's, I'm, it's, I could it's be Mattel. Wrong. I, I think it's I think I, it's a, I think I said you know it's it's Mattel. I think I said so. Correct it in, in in post. It's Mattel. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, so you know, like you know, so these are properties that in the '80s were largely designed. I mean, these these TV series were designed to sell toys, right? I mean, they yeah. they come out when there's a kind of deregulation of children's media content, and they essentially are accused you know, rightfully so of being 30 minute commercials. They're also very creative. I mean, they tell, they create an entire story world around these characters, you know, and they have some very clever ways of like highlighting both the importance of individual characters, but also the importance of collective play, right? You can't have battles yeah. without 15 characters in them because they want you to buy more than one doll. And so it makes sense that when Shira and the princesses of power is re-released on Netflix in 2018, um, that this would also be part of a broader merchandising campaign. But I don't know how much you know about that series, but, you know, it basically uh, it's show it's showrunner uh, Noelle Stevenson, uh, openly queer. And the show itself is very queer, uh, you know, mm-hmm. so the, the mo- many of the characters on that show, you know, uh, exist in a certain, you know, either openly gay or bisexual or, you know, mm-hmm. there's even a, a transgendered character on it. Um, and so, you know, the show itself, I think, you know, I mean, a, certainly I think is a space that if you're if those are if those are themes you care about. They're present, you know, in a space that is, you know, I think a really lovely, also, you know, adventure, you know, space mm-hmm. feeling, featuring very strong female characters. Mm-hmm. Not surprisingly, perhaps, right, because of these kind of queer themes, uh, Mattel backs away very quickly from merchandising. So mm. during the first year of the show, you will find some like, you know, Barbie-esque dolls and things like that that they release, but then they never release it afterwards, you know. So it suggests that at the end of the day that like, you know, their investment in sort of producing merchandise, uh, you know, uh, maybe hits hits a wall when it comes to the concerns that retailers have over how well this would fly on, on shelves and things like that. As a result, you know, if you are, you know, if you're a fan of this show, um, you can't find stuff. So you have to basically uh, engage in a, com- a combination of things. You have to really work through a lot of these uh, sort of entrepreneurial sites on Etsy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And get stuff commissioned or, or or buy stuff that's being made there, or you have to do some really deep diving into searching for these, you know, op- merchandising opportunities that existed right at the early onset of the show. And so, a lot of what we're doing, you know, uh, is we are sort of working collectively to try to, you know, um, co- you know. Um, some of the stuff is going to be very expensive, I should say. So what my kids and I are doing is we're kind of doing this, you know, this kind of um, archaeology experiment, if you will, where what we're doing is we're sort of tracing together. My kids are now 12, so they're not you know, mm-hmm. young. They're in a place where they are interested in these things. Um, but we're tracing together the sort of lineage of how some of these sort of opportunities come about. Like there was, for example, a partnership between Netflix and um, Sonic. Uh, you know, for a very brief period of time, they produced mm-hmm. the Shira, Princess of Power giveaways with your kids' meal. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, and so like, can we trace and find some of these things? And actually, I think that that is something where a lot of getting back to a question you asked earlier. Uh, you know, when we think about what fan community, the distinction between a fan who buys things versus just somebody who buys, just a regular consumer buys things, a lot of it I think has to do with the kind of way in which that object is part of a sort of opportunity to build sort of build and participate in sort of the build the creation of essentially archival knowledge around particular experiences right so mm-hmm. you know yes the object might say something about me you know if you came to my house or if i put a put a photo of it online uh, it is an opportunity for me to me to express something about who i am but oftentimes you know a lot of fan acquisition practices are very much connected to wanting to sort of construct if you will an alternate oh, yes. uh an alternate history uh you mm-hmm. know a kind of cultural history that is often ignored right you know that oftentimes a lot of the branded products that get created um around uh you know sort of fandoms are seen as ephemeral they're seen as you know sort of unimportant uh, mm-hmm. but oftentimes they are you know their importance not are not only to that particular individual or to that community but they actually provide really meaningful snapshots in time uh, around a particular sort of, you know, moment that actually can be very illuminating about a broader historical practice, right? So the other thing that, you know, I'm doing right now is I'm 
invested in um, collecting merchandise, licensed merchandise that came out of the original Dune film adaptation, the film directed by David Lynch in 1985. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this film. You ever seen the, you ever seen the original the, Dune? I haven't seen the original. All right. So um, are you familiar with David Lynch's work? Yes. All yeah. right. So as you might have, if you're familiar with David Lynch's work, you might imagine that this is not going to be a family-friendly sci-fi romp because his work is often disturbing and gross, uh, you know, and, and methodical and slow. And it's really more art than it is like uh-huh. genre-based. Um and if you watch the film, that's exactly what you're getting. However, you know the um, you know the studio that produced the film believed that what they had on their hands was the next Star Wars, and mm-hmm. so they produced this array of merchandise around the film: action figures, vehicles, uh, all you know, kids' birthday party ephemera, because they really <laughs> thought this was going to be it. They were going to make this killing, which of course it didn't happen. Um, you know, uh, and so as a result, you know, you can't, it's hard to find a lot of these things. They, you know, sort of came and went off the shelves very quickly, but they're also very revealed, you know, and so on, if you're a collector, it's kind of fun to have some of these things because they capture, you know, that kind of, you know, something that is rare. But what, what's most interesting for me is the ability to basically use these objects to tell a story about the ways in which oftentimes brand owners don't understand what their consumers want, right? Mm-hmm. How this is an example of a failed merchandising and licensing story right you know why would anybody watching this film think that kids are going to want to play with this stuff nobody in their right mind were would mm-hmm. but it's because they're following a sort of set script of what they think like well it's a sci-fi movie and you know star wars sold all these toys so we're going to sell all these toys no one hand is not talking to the other so it's a useful you know to, so owning these things allows me to essentially you know tell a story about a moment in time where the entertainment industries uh, hmm. you know, we're not necessarily working effectively well together to understand their audience, to understand the consumer, mm-hmm. where consumer product divisions oftentimes just follow the leads of the studios rather than actually thinking about, well, let's actually watch this film and figure out, you know, where might there be a actual meaningful consumer or fan audience for this? It's certainly mm-hmm. not going to be kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so I, I mean, so when we think about why fans buy stuff, it's often for those abilities to, you know, participate in that archiving, archiving of history of that ability to sort of tap into a certain knowledge set that is, you know, usually perceived as unimportant, right? I mean, at the mm-hmm. end of the day, I mean, you know, compared to compared to many other things happening in the world, perhaps this failure to, to effectively merchandise Dune seems small, but it's actually some, you know, but for that community of fans, it can be a very important pathway into sort of talking about the relationship between consumers and brand owners, uh, you know, and, and and advocating for different practices, oftentimes by pointing out what's not worked. Some of that stuff's kind of fun to have, but it's fun. Well, even nostalgia for the time period or whatever memories connected sure. to it. Absolutely. You know, I, I think of like the, I call them Taco Bell movies, but they're mm-hmm. all the movies that used to be on the, on the collector's cups for the Taco Bell drive-thru or, or you know, those yeah, are all, yeah, yeah. you know, like from back in the day, like Honey, I, I, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids or Shrunk the Kids. This is like one of those movies that for some reason is like burned in my mind mm-hmm. um, just from from a, just the fantasy side of it as a kid. But then also then going through the drive through and trying to collect the cups. And then, you know, I remember that summer so keenly just because of those cups. It's it's a really interesting nostalgia play and and thinking of archiving and a way to to experience that that feeling again. I think that's exactly right. I think what would, and I think as a personalized form of fandom, that's oftentimes what these objects can do is they can tap into that, that nostalgia, that sort of memory that you have, that moment in time. I think as you move into a collective piece, right, it's about what you then, you know, those, these objects allow you to, so that, I think you're capturing really what's the heart of a lot of things, right? It's not so much that this, you know, honey, I shrunk the kids, you know, uh, Taco Bell cup. Uh, you know, uh, you know, demonstrates anything deep and meaningful about your relationship to that particular movie. <clears throat> Owning that object allows you to say something about yourself, mm-hmm. right? So it's its value is how it allows you to express something about who you are, right? And it, uh, you know, um, it might allow you to demonstrate knowledge that you have about the cultural or economic or business relationship mm-hmm. that generated this, right? So it allows you to kind of participate in a certain kind of knowledge economy. 
uh, that mm-hmm. could have more of a communal aspect. It could be a weird thing that allows you to sort of establish a certain kind of, you know, uh, reputation amongst peers. You know, oh, he's the kind of person who owns these oddities, right? And they mm-hmm. sort of allow, they give this, they help you sort of, you know, sort of position yourself within a particular group of people. Um, mm-hmm. Increasingly, I think a lot of fans around, you know, this is the 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 the, the key uh, here is that, you know, uh, a lot of the times the relationships that people have with brands and with objects is not any deep filiality to the text, right? I mean, this is mm-hmm. something you've asked this question, but in the, one of the questions you'd send me, but we didn't really talk about was, you know, what's the difference between, let's say, a fan of a, of a brand, you know, a brand versus a fan of a media property? A lot mm-hmm. of it has to do with the way stories align, right? That when mm-hmm. you are, at the end of the day, you know, when you're a fan of a media property, right, um, you may, in fact, you know, your that fandom may exist at the level of narrative, right? Where you are able to engage in conversations with other communities around the story, around characterization, around plot, around these things. Uh, but it's also oftentimes about an engaged knowledge around the production of mm-hmm. that property. And it's an engaged sort of conversation around uh, the story of being a fan in that community, right? That story is just as, oftentimes the story of being a fan in that community is just as important, if not more important, than the story of the of that property itself, mm-hmm. right? When you're a fan of, let's say, you know, Nike or, you know, and any other brand out there, you know, brand, the you know, there's not a clear narrative. I mean, Nike, sometimes Nike will attempt or sometimes brands will attempt to create a, a very clear, coherent narrative around that. But oftentimes what you're dealing with is a kind of brand story, right? A set of like ideas attached to the brand that, you know, may resonate with certain consumers. So it's actually more actively likely the case that uh, what those brands have to do to cultivate fans is allow for the fan's story, for the consumer story to emerge through the brand, right? That owning this object allows you to say something about yourself, right? Mm -hmm. It's not so much about Nike. It's about the way in which, you know, somebody saying, hey, those are really, that's a really cool, you know, uh, whatever, you know, set set, set of sneakers you have. Well, this will allow you to tell a story about how you bought them, where you found them, you know, uh, why they're you know, meaningful to you, how, you know, you were wearing them when you met, you know, your future partner, uh, mm-hmm. right? That these objects have to be able to sort of give that space for consumers, you know, to be able to tell their story through them. And in so doing, align the brand with those stories. And mm-hmm. that's different than basically trying to sort of create a fictional consumer that is instantly aligned with that brand it's often you have to do much more of that kind of grounded sociological work to understand what consumers want mm-hmm. yeah sometimes I, I i read a lot of you know uh, audience profiles or consumer profiles um and sometimes i just don't think they add a lot of value when you think of from, from a brand perspective because I, I don't think it necessarily gets at either some of those psychological needs those stories whatever whatever the connection is is usually such a um i'm like a stamp of like what you would expect this person is so old they make so much money live here they tend to do this they like basketball they interact with basketball by doing this um and and that's kind of it um so i I definitely think there's a lot of opportunity and and as far as research and consumer marketing and really how how to channel that more um and that's that's something we're after something we're, we're we're studying and trying to figure out as we um go on down this path of fandom are you going to uh, are you guys going to conventions or comic cons or anything like that are you sort of setting up space there to talk to people we've we've been doing we've been doing that's part of the that's part of the program or part of our future work as of now our our strategist has been working and doing different surveys and polls and out there talking with folks and collecting data and interpreting um what trying to interpret s- some some insights and in, and in how that could unfold for or be a value for a brand um we're going to be coming out with a report in the next i don't know a couple of weeks to a month um that i'm happy to send you as well that 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 breaks down some of that. that yeah i'd love this. to see that yeah i do think you know i think you're absolutely right that there's a lot of opportunity for you know brand consultants and types of you know uh, to to really understand fan practice and some of the kind of experiential sort of components mm-hmm. that drive a lot of activity i do think you know i think surveys are great you know i think they're useful i'm glad you're doing that i really ultimately think the most insight you're going to gain is going to be ethnographic mm-hmm. right so i think it's about 
you know, uh, actually doing some participant observation in spaces where fan communities exist. Those can be physical spaces. I mean, obviously that's why like comic cons or, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, various, you know, memorabilia conventions or brand convention or like, you know, D3 conventions can be mm-hmm. really useful to mm-hmm. sort of just observe what people are doing and where and yeah, where totally you begin to see some of the kind of like what seems like mundane practice be central to like the experience for that community. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really, I mean, I strongly encourage that kind of immersive work, um, mm-hmm. you know, when you can get it. And I think, frankly, just also just listening. I mean, and generally the truth about it, all brand owners, right? So there's because branding is is so much a part of marketing mm-hmm. that there's often this strong desire to speak to consumers, uh, you know, and 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 I wonder if there's more value to be gained in figuring out how to listen to consumers in a real meaningful way. I and mean, there's always a claim that we're listening, but I'm not sure what you know. Often mm-hmm. that that listening comes when someone sends like a you know a comment through a feedback channel, mm-hmm. uh, which is not the same as actually engaging them where they're at in their practice so no i think it's a, a great point um and there, there's i think there's a lot of case studies out there that that have shown how certain properties have listened well i think uh, th- i talked about this one of my other i know one of our other episodes that hasn't aired yet but the uh, hbo series last of us i thought did an excellent job of of some of the social listening and how to really keep things authentic for those for those big fans of the, of the video game but also um, use it for a way to get them to be advocates and 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 help um, speak for the show, market the show in their own terms, in their own ways, and gave them sort of the, those tools. Um, when if people are interested in reading more about your writing and your work, where can they find some of that stuff? Uh, I mean, you know, on Amazon, all is all. Uh, okay. you know, so I have two books. I have a uh, you know the one uh, first one is selling the silver bullet, which is gonna use the Lone Ranger as a prolonged case study to look at the early history of character licensing and merchandising uh, in the entertainment industries from the 1930s to the present. And then I just recently published a book through Routledge called Configuring the Field of Character Entertainment Licensing. This is using uh, in-depth interviews and participant observation at, at the licensing expo in Las Vegas to talk about, you know, sort of how the field of licensing is cultivated, how people who do this work come to understand what the work is and how are sort of negotiating and navigating sort of the shifting terrain of licensing and merchandising around particularly things related to digital, but also globalization and um, a sort of uh, consolidation of retail, right? So the, the, the sort of shift away from, you know, many different retail opportunities. So um, I think, you know, that book is really kind of designed to think about sort of the not the how, it's not a it's not a how to book it's not a how to do the work of licensing but a really an understanding of just sort of what people working in the field understand the field to be in this particular moment and then you know i mean i you know i think uh you obviously came across my essay on fans and merchandise i've also published work on um sort of uh retail and like retails as, as a storytelling site uh which i'm happy to send you a copy of that article on and then this forthcoming piece on uh hot topic uh, you know, as a kind of interesting sort of case study for thinking about uh, the intersection of fandom and and consumer culture. I am working right now on a collection of essays with a collaborative mo- a collaborator of mine, and you might be interested in talking to as well. Her name is Elizabeth Afuso, um, and it's a collection of essays tentatively titled "Acquiring Fandom." And so, the goal of this ed- collection is to take seriously the practice of acquisition within fan cultures, right? To really think about, you know, what are some of the things that, that drive acquisition choices among fans, uh, how acquisition becomes a meaningful space of identity and community formation, but also a site of, a site of struggle over decision-making. And it's also a space where we're working through increasingly the acquisition of lifestyle, acquisition of fandom as a lifestyle, right? The mm-hmm. way in which basically lifestyle is connected to acquisition practices. So that's that's a couple of years away from being on shelves, but we're actively working on that now. So that's the next piece. Great. Well, thanks so much for joining us. I really enjoyed the conversation, uh, and I will definitely be in touch. I want to follow up with you on those on those links. Happy to follow up. Appreciate your time. Hope it was useful. Talk to you soon. 
Thank you so much for listening into the Fan Lab. We hope you've enjoyed our deep dive into the cultivating world of fandom. And as we continue to explore it, we invite you to take the next step with us. Head on over to our website and download our newest report, Decoding Fandom. It's full of insights and case studies telling the story of how fandom can create long-term value for brands. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and stay tuned to our next episode. 